And this is 2008, right? So all the new project templates are kind of already baked on in. So here, if I were to go under the Windows area for my language of choice, first thing I want to point out is this guy. <laughs> I've been wanting that guy for a long time. Okay, look at what I can now do. When I make a project, I can actually pick which version of the framework I want to target. So I don't have to worry about having 27 versions of Visual Studio installed anymore. Okay? So we'll make sure that we keep it here at 3.5. And we want to build a WPF application. There's that XAML browser app I talked about. We'll just go for this guy here. And we're just going to do um, how does this work app. So we're not going to really add too much to this, but I want to kind of show you how these pieces are working in the background to constitute your assembly. Okay, so let me go into full screen mode. So we can see that we have a very different type of designer for a WPF program. Um, probably the most interesting piece here is this kind of dual look and feel. So I have a designer and the XAML to represent it, right? So remember we said for a desktop application, you have to have something extending window and something extending application. Well, this is my window, right? So here's my opening root element. So we might want to say, well, inside of my window is going to be a grid. That's just one of the possible layout managers. And we'll just kind of put in a button. Button. And we'll give him a name. We'll call it BTN Click. And why don't we also give this guy a height of uh, 40 and a width of 100. This is new. If any of you guys have worked with earlier versions of the, uh, the betas, they finally now have a way to handle events in the designer. Okay, before there was no support to do that. So if I want to handle the click event for this button, I can just say click, and now I can just specify my handler, and it automatically wrote the code in the code file. Right? And then we'll go ahead and close off my button definition. And we can see there's my little button right there. Okay? And for this first example, that's all I'm going to do. Because all I want to show you guys right now is how it's all tying together. Right? So now let's take a look at the code file. We can see here's the event handler that it wrote. So it's good to know that at least some things have not changed. Message box dot show, <laughs> right? I was clicked. So I run the program. I just get a basic little application, which looks pretty much like a Windows Forms application, right? But how it's actually constructed in the background is wickedly different. So let's take a look at what we have here. Okay. Notice that when I made this project workspace, I have a window represented by a XAML file and the code file. Again, kind of a la ASP.NET. Right? I also have an application class. And that's our guy extending application. Remember we said we had to have one of him as well. Okay. Well, the question is, all of this XAML, and for this simple example, there isn't too much XAML, but what really becomes of it? Because all I have to really give to an end user is my executable. Okay? You never have to worry about shipping along all the XAML files. right? You could certainly have a bunch of XAML files that you load up dynamically at runtime. That would be fine too, but you can have it all just self-contained. Right? Well, let's take a little deeper look at what's going to happen here. So look at again how I set up my really simple XAML description. I have a window named window1. Right? It has a grid with no name. I didn't use the name property. But I do have a button with a name. Well we already saw how this event handler is actually going to be stored in the related code file. So that's where we saw this guy right down here. But when I compile my project, all the XAML is fed into a real code you know, representation. Right? And I can actually see that if I come over here and go under the OBJ debug folder. 
Okay? There is a special little file that has a G infix, and that stands for generated, compiler generated. Right? Did you notice how my window is a partial class? I think we all know what the partial keyword means, right? Part of my definition is elsewhere. Well, where is the elsewhere? It's in the G file. So if I were to take a look at this, and again, remember, this is all out of sight, out of mind. You don't ever have to touch this thing. But if I just kind of take a look, we'll find that there's my button, for example. Okay? So all the XAML that I typed up, if I give that guy a name, it's going to result in a member variable in my class. More interestingly, if I take a look at what's going on here inside of initialized component, there is a blob of code which is looking for an embedded resource in my assembly. And it's going to load that up based on the name I had with my actual XAML file. So what is this piece all about? Well, when you first look at that, you might mistakenly think, oh, geez, I've got to ship along my XAML file. That's not the case. When you compile a WPF program that makes use of XAML, all the markup is put into a compact binary format that was BAML that I mentioned earlier. Okay? BAML becomes an embedded resource in your assembly. So when your application loads up, this guy is going to extract out the embedded resource in order to hydrate all the widgets. Okay? And we can actually see that too. If we go back over here, we can find inside of my file Let me actually run this guy. There he is. I just didn't see him. My BAML file. Right? So this is the binary version of my XAML. And if we look carefully, remember I had it 40 by 100 is my height and my width. Right? There's the name of my button right there. There's my title for my window. So this is just a, a compact version of XAML. Okay? And BAML and XAML can both be parsed at runtime. Right? So you can do all the kind of fancy things you would hope. So you kind of get how this is all working. You know, from our viewpoint, we just see a XAML file that describes look and feel, a code file that represents the functionality. When things are compiled, all the BAML is mapped into a second partial class definition. Right? And this embedded BAML resource contains the actual look and feel for all the widgets. Does that make sense? Cool. Let me just show you a couple of final demos, then I got to tootle on to do my WCF piece. So let's go look at... I'll do this one first. Okay, remember we talked about styles? Right? The ability to kind of define a look and feel of something and then apply it dynamically or declaratively. Well, let's just take a look at this uh, more interesting XAML description. Okay, now this is a real simple program. I'll go ahead and run it just so you can see what it does. I can click on any one of these items in my list box and it's going to make the button adopt different styles. Right? Now I'm able to do all this just on the fly at runtime. Okay, but notice the important piece here. The button is still the button. Right? No matter which style I put on there, I'm still handling the click event. Right? Well, all these styles, even though they're a bit on the lame side, remember I'm not the designer, but this has all been described in XAML as well. 